Rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide among young people have risen dramatically in the last decade. A much buzzed about book out this week tracks the possible causes and potential solutions for what author Jonathan Haidt calls the anxious generation. Brooke Silva Braga met the NYU sociologist as he made his case for four dramatic changes in the way America raises its children. This has to stop. Using little more than a whisper quiet voice in a PowerPoint presentation, Jonathan Haidt is attempting a kind of revolution. We have overprotected our children in the real world and underprotected them online. He wants us to totally rethink what truly endangers our kids. So for a whole variety of reasons, parenting changed in the English speaking world in the 1990s. It became paranoid. So I wanted to dramatize just how quick and extreme this change was. First, Haidt asks his middle-aged audience how old they were when they could first venture away from home on their own. Yell out your age, okay? Six, eight, six, six. So that's what I always find, six to eight. That was the norm. Then he asks them to shout out the age they've given their own kids that same freedom. And all you hear is double-digit numbers. Almost perfect uniformity, 10 to 12. And that's insane. The crime rate is way down. Everything is so much safer, but we're afraid, we're paranoid about our kids' safety. And why is that a bad thing? Because the way that a human being becomes a self-governing, autonomous adult is by practicing being a self-governing, autonomous child and adolescent. We've set up a cycle of incompetence. Haidt is a business school professor at NYU. But several years ago, he grew interested in the ways the modern world was changing his students. That research led to the anxious generation, where Haidt argues kids were first made weak by overprotection for mostly imaginary dangers, then given devices that gobble up their attention and let parents keep even closer tabs on them. So who has a phone, their own phone? We checked in with sixth graders in Manhattan and the New York suburb of Port Washington. How many people have a phone? Haidt calls this the great rewiring of childhood. You make the case that this is literally rewiring mm -hmm. people's brains. Yes. Think about neural development. Think about a brain. The neurons feel their way out and they develop based on feedback from experience. But what happens when kids, instead of playing with blocks in each other, they're on screens all the time? You're radically changing the inputs. Kids are now growing up in a sea of screens. He says this rewiring, which started around 2012, and he can't stop his hands from swiping, created the anxious generation. There's a tidal wave of mental illness, and it's especially anxiety and depression. And tragically, we see very much the same pattern with suicide. And this is what happens after 2010, more than doubling of the suicide rate. Now, whether tech is truly to blame is debated by researchers and contested by tech companies. The existing body of scientific work has not shown a causal link between using social media and young people having worse mental health outcomes. Haidt insists the research does show causation, most clearly for teenage girls. But even if it didn't, he says, there are other undeniable impacts. I tell them all the time, jokingly, that they don't know how to play in the park. Vivian Torres told us her 22-year-old son never had trouble playing in the real world, but a decade later, 11-year-old Barbara seems glued to her devices. The phone can be like, like I don't want to say addicting, but like, you know, like it can be like really likable and stuff. So sometimes you're like, oh wait, after this video, I'll go outside, but then at least on to another video and to another video and stuff. How would you describe that moment when you're like, eh, I could go outside, but I guess I'll just do I this. I feel like lazy. Like I feel lazy. I'm like, you know, but I don't want to get up. Do you think there's anything that could change that? Maybe without the phone. And actually Barbara's phone just broke. So she's trying that out. But then there's Height's first point about nervous parents. Even though Vivian grew up here in the Bronx in the more dangerous 1980s, she doesn't feel comfortable letting Barbara go off alone, especially without a phone. Our parents didn't have constant contact with us. Why do we need it with our kids? I don't, I wish, I, I can't answer that because now it just feels like you need to be in contact with people. Is that normal? <laughs> it's become normal. <laughs> Is it so. good? I don't think it's good. I don't like that. I don't like it.
It's funny, you're both saying, you don't like what this has done to me, yeah. but you can't stop it. Yeah. Yeah. All of this is a set of collective action problems. Haidt has no easy solutions, but he does offer some hard ones, asking parents, schools, and tech companies to each do one difficult thing. That's the key. We have to act together. First, for parents, no smartphones before high school, just flip phones if needed. If even a fraction of families stuck to that, Haidt says, those kids wouldn't be socially ostracized, they'd have each other. Second, the ask for schools, no phone use ever within their buildings. Height wants the phones locked up for the whole school day as they are in Joe D'Amico's class at the Professional Performing Arts School. It really does help. They were much more distracted when they had their phones on them. Third, the big ask for tech companies or possibly for lawmakers, no social media until 16. Right now, the minimum age is 13, but even that is unenforced. These are 11 and 12 year olds. How many folks are on Instagram? So about half. How many are on Instagram? TikTok. TikTok. Snapchat? Snapchat? Meta, Instagram's owner, declined our interview request. So did TikTok. Snap never responded. But in a statement, Meta told us enforcing the age rules requires the help of device makers like Apple and Google. Apple and Google also declined our interview requests, but have pointed out their devices already come with parental controls. Still, taken together, these efforts from some of the world's largest companies are not smarter than a sixth grader. And so how'd you get on? Um, lie about your age. Lie about your age. Oh. If you're not 13, how are you on the apps? Oh. Fake age. Then I switched the year. No one really says anything about it. I think most of the apps don't really care. Many parents told us the battle over kids' tech use was already lost. But Joe D'Amico says he hopes the experience of these kids will lead the next crop of parents to make different choices. When we have our next incoming class of sixth graders come in, I want to make a strong push that if you haven't already given your child a smartphone, don't get them flip phone. Here's why. But if all we do is get parents to take away that stuff and don't give them freedom, what are they going to do? Just sit and look at the wall? So Haidt has also co-founded a group called Let Grow. So take a look at the different ideas. Both the classes we visited were just starting the program. You have to learn how to do these things, right? Kids are asked to do something independent. Pour it into the tray. Something they haven't done before. I'm opening the oven now. God bless you. Barbara Baez went grocery shopping for the first time all by herself. Well, yes, she did let our cameraman tag along. And yes, she grabbed Fruity Pebbles, Ramen Noodles, and Doritos. How was it? It was amazing. <laughs> I'm super proud. You're smiling. I feel really like, finally, I feel really, really proud of myself. For CBS Saturday Morning, Brooke Silva Braga, New York. I love this. I just love the idea of of thinking, the you game. love the idea yeah. of thinking about it at least, if not of the well, no, I love, that I, you... I, I love, it's like, it's like, you know, back to the future. It really is. It's, it's like giving our kids some hope. I think about anxiety a lot because it's something our kids face. It's hard. We have kids that are yeah, in this yeah. range and I right. think about it, I'm like, oh man, we do yeah. that. We didn't let him do stuff on his own until double digit age, that kind of thing. Oh, I don't every know parent why. says the same thing. Yeah. I, I was allowed out when I was seven, yeah. and today it's like 13 or something, mm -hmm. yeah. whatever it is. It's just banning social media till they're 16 seems like a really yeah. big what? ask or yeah. a hard thing to do. The, the point that he made, everybody, it's like a cold turkey for society. Yeah. Oh, you know? More discussion to come on yeah. this. Yeah. This morning, super communicators. It's a new book by a Pulitzer Prize winning author who sold more than 10 million books, including The Power of Habit. Charles Duhigg has been a journalist for two decades, covering everything from wars to financial meltdowns. In both his personal and professional life, he noticed some people seem to be doing it better than others, namely handling conversations. So he set out to discover why. Human beings have evolved to be good at communication. We've, been, we've evolved to be super communicators. The communication has been homo sapiens superpower. But we evolved in a very different time, right? Pre-internet, pre-politics. 
Charles Duhigg believes in the last few years, humans have abandoned our biggest advantage. We've forgotten how to communicate. Some of the, the things that we used to be so good at have, have fallen out of our lives. Super Communicators takes a look at people who seem to be able to connect with anyone and why they're so good at it. It's a skill Duhigg believes is badly needed today. It's not like we're asking you to like be a superhero or like lift a car with your bare hands. It's having a conversation where you're thinking to yourself like, I'm not sure I want to talk to that person. I'll just go over and I'll ask him a question. A couple things put Duhigg on this path. Like when he was named a manager at the New York Times and realized he was good at developing strategy, but terrible at explaining it. Or when his dad passed away. You got a lot of people saying, I'm sorry but you said nobody was asking you questions. Yeah, I was desperate to talk about it. And anyone who's lost a parent or anyone else knows that it's one of these hugely meaningful moments and then you come back from it and you tell people that it's happened and they say, I'm sorry, or you know, my condolences, and then they move on to other topics. Duhigg's book jumps from the CIA recruitment process to jury selection, to how astronauts are picked, why the Big Bang Theory worked on TV, and how Netflix handles controversy. One of the things that we know about people who are super communicators, consistent super communicators, is that they tend to ask a lot more questions, like 10 to 20 times as many questions as the average person. Some of the questions are so slight, like, hey, what do you think about that? Or, or oh yeah, what'd you say next? Like these invitations to come into a conversation. We don't even register them. I feel like as we're doing this, you're judging my ability <laughs> as a super communicator. I am not. Or not. I am not. You're, you're very good. You're asking questions, which is like the number one thing, right? At the University of Chicago Booth Business School, we watched as an experiment played out. In just a minute, I'm going to have you get up. I'm going to pair you up with another person. A group of total strangers were randomly paired up and asked to discuss four deep questions. What in life are you most grateful for? If a crystal ball could tell you anything about your future, what would it be? If you were going to become a close friend with someone, what's the most important thing for them to know? And when was the last time you cried in front of another person? I'm notoriously like a horrible crier. So I also, once I start, like get overwhelmed that I am. The questions led to immediate anxiety in the room. I feel that's a kind of private question. I feel the same way. I, I... Then people started talking. So if the crystal ball can tell you anything on the planet, you want to know if your crush likes you back? <laughs> yeah. What University of Chicago professor Nicholas Epley has discovered after doing experiments like this thousands of times is that expectations for how a conversation is going to go are very different than how it actually did. It was what I expected in my head, where it's like, it's uncomfortable, but it feels meaningful. My conversation partner was like very, very sharing and very honest. At the end, I wanted to like give her a hug and tell her thank you. <laughs> and I was that, I think like, she'd have given you a hug. I think she would have. In short, people, when open to it, can connect really, really fast. What you can tell with an experiment, when you average across a lot of people, is you can pull out the consistent signal. And the consistent signal that we find is that when people sit down and have a conversation with somebody, it tends to go better than they expect it will, and that signal is very powerful. You ended up liking the person more than you thought you would, you ended up enjoying the conversation more than you thought you would, and you also ended up having more in common. Everybody thinks that the person they've assigned to is their soulmate partner. Yep, absolutely. And it would have happened with yep. the other person. <laughs> in all likelihood, to a similar extent. In the experiment, people are randomly assigned to each other. So it's not that they were lucky to have been paired with somebody else. It was purely random, but it doesn't feel that way. These results are just relentlessly robust. We see this over and over and over and over again. Why does this subject fascinate you so much? Why would you study anything else? How can it not? Like the, we are fundamentally social human beings. Yeah. We are built down to the ground to connect and engage with others. But it strikes me there's just a fundamental paradox at the core of social life. We 
We're happier and healthier when we connect with others. Yet look around out in the world. There are lots of opportunities to engage and connect with other people that they just don't take. Almost any time you're considering reaching out and trying to connect with another person in a positive or meaningful way, we hold ourselves back a little too much. When we're able to super communicate, are there things that are happening to us physically, yeah. not just mentally? Yeah. So in this conversation, we're having a conversation right now, neither of us are aware of this, but our pupils have started dilating at the same rate. And our breath patterns have started to match each other. And our heart rates have started to match. And most importantly, your brain waves, your, your neural activity, is starting to look like my neural activity and vice versa. Within neurology, this is known as neural entrainment, that we become neurally synchronized. Are super communicators born or made? Super communicators are absolutely made and anyone can become a super communicator. We all know these people, right? They're the person that we call after a bad day mm -hmm. who makes us feel better. Yeah. Our brains crave connection. And in the end, being a super communicator keeps you alive longer. Oh, absolutely. The single most reliable indicator of whether someone will be healthy and happy and successful at age 65 is having strong relationships at age 45. So they do these experiments on people, and first you talk about extroverts. They ask extroverts what they think the best part of their day is going to be. And the extroverts say, when I spend time with other people. They ask introverts, and they say, what do you think the best time part of your day is going to be? They say, when I'm alone, right? Turns out the extroverts are right, the introverts are wrong. In both cases, when wow. they test people, wow. the best part of their day, no matter what you think you are, right. are the times you're with other people and are sharing that time with other people. That's amazing. I, the synchronization of mind and breath, does that bring everyone into an equilibrium if someone's like more hyper or someone's, you know, more like when they're key, having those conversations? Does it bring them into an equilibrium or does it bring one to that state and another to that state? How I guess maybe all to a level where you just they connect can, somewhere. Can that was really that was cool. yeah, that was so fast. Did you that feel very connected part. as you were doing those interviews? You know, when he's talking about our pupils are dilating yeah. at the same rate and our brains are on the same wave right now, uh -huh. that's that's a little mind blowing to think about. <laughs> that is when you're talking to someone, but it's also cool to it, think it about, is really right? cool that it you is. can connect with someone, and also how quickly you can connect with someone if you're if you're open. Right? Well, first it just takes um, the eye contact. You look at someone in the eye yeah. and, and really you feel them, yeah. right? But also but, we do this for a living and it explains why sometimes you really feel connected with the people yeah. whose stories you are sharing. But the biggest thing is the questions, asking questions. Asking questions. Mm -hmm. This morning, Stephanie Wilder Taylor, former stand-up comic turned television producer turned author. Her irreverent books on parenting, Sippy Cups Are Not For Chardonnay, and Nap Time is the New Happy Hour were both bestsellers, celebrating mommy wine culture and playdate cocktail parties. Then something changed. She began putting herself in danger. She put her kids in danger. So Fun Mom sobered up. Wilder Taylor writes about all of it in her new book, Drunkish. I remember going to parties like pretty much every weekend. Stephanie Wilder Taylor has never had a problem being the life of the party, especially when she started drinking at the age of 14. When I drank the very first time, I'd never kissed a boy before, and I was on this double date with my friend, and they brought some beer, and I remember having a couple beers and feeling like, oh my God, like I could do anything. And it gave me this good feeling of like, oh, I think I could do this. And you did. that's a powerful feeling, yes. And then I had my first kiss. <laughs> her drinking over the years accelerated, along with her career. All right, let's do this. From stand-up comedy Show me the funny. to working on TV game shows, Wilder Taylor was a blast. In her late 30s, she became a mom. Alcohol had always been a part of my life and always I always thought of it as fun. And when I had a baby, a lot of my entertainment options didn't seem open to me anymore. And I felt this anxiety all the time of like, oh my gosh, my life is so different. I don't get to see my friends. A lot of my friends were stand-up comedians who were still going out every night. And I think that I turned a little bit back to drinking as a way to A, cope. 
I was having postpartum anxiety. Having a baby though, it is a little stressful, so I have, I've gone into therapy. You know, it wasn't that I was feeling trapped, it was just that I was feeling very, um, lack of freedom. I'm not sure I'm seeing results. It's, it's aromatherapy, and um... Did you get a sense from other moms that they felt similar? That, that well, that's trapped, the theme. lack of freedom? So I started a blog, and I realized quickly that a lot of moms out there in the blogosphere were talking about their wine. Her blog became a best-selling book. Sippy cups are not for Chardonnay. I actually wanted to call it Sippy Cups are not for scotch because it's such an emergency drink, but then I thought, <laughs> you know. That was followed by Nap Time is the new happy hour. When you look back on those books, mm -hmm. do you feel bad? No, I don't. Wilder Taylor says she wasn't telling people to drink and she wasn't offering recipes, but she was, as the books continued to sell, thinking privately about how much she was consuming herself usually convincing herself she was fine. Like when she drove her kids to one particular party. The day that changed everything. I always think I've had two drinks, even when I've had six drinks. I'm like, I'm on my second drink. So my brain told me that I was totally fine to drive. I got in the car, I had my four-year-old and my one of my toddlers with me, and I drove home, and it was a short drive but when I got home, my husband was absolutely furious. He knew I'd been drinking. In that moment, I still honestly was like, I was fine, What he is so overreacting, this is ridiculous. But I woke up in the morning and I realized that my even my memory of the night was spotty. And so I knew 100% that I'd gotten drunk and I'd driven my kids in the car. And I saw the whole thing and I was so like ashamed and there was just no other way to look at it. There was no other way to see the way I drank. I was like, I'm not safe when I drink, I'm not predictable. Mm -hmm. And so I have to do something different. Like I cannot drink again and I have to do whatever it takes. And that was it? That's the last time I drank, yeah. May 22nd, 2009. Quitting drinking got some attention at the time but Wilder Taylor never wrote the whole story until now. Prompted not just by what she'd done to help herself, but what she could potentially do to help others. Yeah. And I'm constantly catastrophizing and then going, okay, what's worst case scenario? I found that every time addiction or talking about quitting drinking or sobriety came up in my podcast, I'd get people saying, it helps me so much when you talk about this. You know, it helps me, um, it, it destigmatizes it for me. It helps me feel more normal that I'm struggling with this or it helps me take a look at it or all these things. And I just, it started occurring to me, wouldn't it be great if I could do like sippy cups or not for Chardonnay, but for like my sobriety. Drunkish is both funny and scary, but not and this was important to her, preachy. I think one of the helpful things you do in the book is not offer a prescription. Mm -hmm. It's like your attitude is do what works for you. Yeah. Now that doesn't mean be destructive. Right. But you know what I'm saying. I think there's not one way, if people are wondering if they drink too much, like I'm not, I can't tell somebody. I mean, I get asked all the time, you know, how do I know if I have a drinking problem? I don't, I don't know. It's like that's something that you have to figure out for yourself. But, but if you're asking me that question, yeah. you may want to think about it. Right. If you're spending mental energy worrying about how much you drink, that's definitely something to take a look at. And I would, I would encourage anybody to just examine it. When you feel uncomfortable now, mm -hmm. what do you do? Usually call somebody and talk about it or do something to distract myself or do other things that are seem addictive, like play games on my phone, or I just try to zone out in some way. Watch TV. I still have lots of unhealthy habits. She does these podcasts now where she talks about all of this, you know, mm -hmm. frequently, or, or whatever's on her mind. You may agree or disagree with it, but she's doing it now with a clear head. I noticed that she didn't use the word alcoholic. I mean, is, does she consider herself 
addicted to alcohol in that way? She talks about a lot of that in the book. I mean, I think you have to read it to fully appreciate it. how she feels about all this. But, you know, she, as she talks about, she gets, she's gotten support from friends, from people she's spoken with. As she says, when she feels weird now, she'll pick up the phone and call somebody. And I think her, the idea that people were getting help from it is an amazing thing of people that will read and get help from it. You just 100%. don't realize the reach that you can have. Absolutely. Kudos to her. Yeah, really nice piece, Jeff. It's a concept that even the ancient Greeks understood and recommended, a phrase that says we should do everything in moderation. Dates back all the way to Greece in the 6th century BC. But charting that middle path amid all the temptations we face remains a daily challenge for so many of us. And it's the subject of a fascinating new book by author Michael Easter, The Scarcity Brain. 200, look at that. There's a lesson. I'm gonna win this one. Inside the Center for Gaming Innovation at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. That is it. Row a cowboy boot, bam. <laughs> That's a good one. Where science journalist Michael Easter came to learn about the nature of gambling. So what does this tell us about ourselves? This tells us that we love random rewards. They capture our attention. So if you know you'll get something of value, you don't know when, you don't know how big it's gonna be, you will pay attention to that. Experts here create and test new high-tech casino games for a host of companies. And that was key in research for Easter's book, Scarcity Brain. I suppose no better laboratory than Vegas to study human behavior. No, there isn't. You see people from all different backgrounds, but they're all here for the same reason, to have fun, to have a good time, and that usually involves doing things to excess. <laughs> that excess, Easter says, is driven by what he calls the scarcity loop. What is the scarcity loop? It is a behavior loop that pushes us to repeat behaviors quickly that can be fun in the short term, but hurtful in the long term. So it's got three parts. It's got opportunity, it's got unpredictable rewards, and it's got quick repeatability. So opportunity, you have an opportunity to get something that enhances your life, gives you something of value. Two, unpredictable rewards. The scarcity loop has been ingrained in our brains since the beginning of man when seeking and consuming meant staying alive. Our tendency to try and always acquire more, whether it's food, stuff, information, status, whatever it might be, that is an ancient drive. And so it's not necessarily your fault that you sort of overdo how those behaviors are expressed, but it is your problem to solve. A difficult problem to solve in our world of evolving technology where services and apps purposely use scarcity cues. It's everywhere, it's in social media, it's being put into finance apps, personal finance apps, it's what makes dating apps work, it's being put into sports betting applications, for example. It's in so many different places in our life and it's unparalleled at taking our time and attention, I think. We see things like points, leaderboards, and prompts to increase our engagement. That gamification has captured the attention of Gary Gensler. Underpinning many of these features is predictive data analytics. This allows companies to analyze the success of individual prompts and to increase activity. He's the chair of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Following the wrong prompt on a trading app, though, could have a substantial effect on a saver's financial position. Many of these features encourage investors to trade more. In the scarcity loop, would you consider that we lose our ability to be content and happy? Yeah, I think that you can get a short-term fleeting hit of something that feels like happiness from a purchase, from getting a handful of likes on Twitter or Instagram or whatever your social media drug of choice might be from the next drink, from different, you know, hypercaloric foods. But ultimately, you know, it goes away pretty quick. And then naturally, we as humans, we want the next one. Easter traveled around the world to answer this question. How do we stop wanting more? First is just by becoming aware of it. The second part is that you can change or remove any of the three parts. So you can take away the opportunity or change it. It's like if your cell phone is your problem, well, even just keeping your cell phone in the other room, as simple as that sounds, that barrier to entry of time and the ability to not just 
pull it out like you're a gunslinger will tend to lessen the time you spend. The third step is about our environment and why we escape into the scarcity loop in the first place. A study of pigeons found that the birds will choose to gamble for a jackpot they probably won't win instead of playing a more predictable game, especially if they're isolated or bored. When the scientists put them in a, an environment that was more like an environment they'd live in the wild. So they're having to work to build a nest, they're hanging out with other pigeons, they're getting exercise and exposure, and they're living like a wild pigeon life. And then he puts them back in the uh, game and says, okay, pigeons, pick a game. They start to pick the one that is predictable and ends up getting them more food. So they start to make optimal choices. Easter says humans can learn from these studies and thereby increase their happiness. Having to put in effort, do sort of challenging things, time in nature, physical activity. And when we start to fall below what we need, we start to look for stimulation in other ways. I'm gonna delete the app. <laughs> I haven't figured out why I'm using it. I'm bored, probably. Well, I think too, being okay with being bored is fine. So boredom is this evolutionary discomfort that basically tells you whatever you're doing with your time right now, the return on your time invested is worn thin. But now today, when we feel that discomfort of boredom, that evolutionary cue, we have easy, effortless escapes from it. We can just, boom, candy crush. Boom, I'm gonna check my email for the 99th time today. <laughs> boom, did I get one more like on Instagram or whatever it is? I think that when we look back, we often regret these behaviors. Hacking the scarcity loop can be as easy as stepping outside. It could be some thing you do in nature that gives you big rewards, like fishing. You could gamify fitness in a way, and that would give you a um, benefit over the long term, right? You go to the gym, you're like, I'm gonna do this exercise every time I go to the gym, and I don't know if the number will go up or down. I want it to go up, but I'm not sure what's gonna happen. So then you go and you test yourself and you go, oh, it went up, this is exciting. And for a lot of us, staying in the moment might just be the cure to our need for more. I think in the grand scheme of time and space, although we still have many problems societally to solve, when you look back on how, we've, how far we've come in the last 300 years, I mean, it's amazing to be alive, like full stop amazing. And we often don't stop and appreciate that. And so appreciating that, I think, can give you gratitude and then really can enhance your life in the moment. <sighs> Was this not the perfect assignment for Did someone? Did you learn? <laughs> Did you learn something? I learned so much. I mean, just the, first of all, who knew about pigeons, yeah. you know? I love the yeah. pigeons. Yeah. Pigeons yeah. are gamblers. <laughs> We're the Vegas of the natural yeah. world. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. But I learned, like, just the awareness that you're, why you're doing it just kind of just piqued my, my ability to say, okay, let me take the opportunity away from me. Okay. You know, that, th those are the keys. Now, I did delete the app. The question is, did I go back, back and put it back on? Yeah. Or find a different one to use. Yeah. And it's I, I, just interesting that he points out it's okay to be bored. Yeah. That's that hard. was another That's key. Hard. That's when that you is find tough. things. 